I'm Michael Wise, and I'm going to roll back to January 2009. Uh, at that time, I was 62 years old and really fit. Um, I was jogging six miles three times a week, playing singles tennis once a week for two hours. Also, I was at the peak of my career. I'm a dentist and I'm a specialist in oral surgery. I was extremely fulfilled. In that January, uh, on a Thursday, I suddenly sort of started to feel a bit flu-like. The next morning I got up and I felt awful. My temperature had gone up. I thought I'd have a bath to make myself feel better, but I hardly get in the bath. And when I got in, I couldn't get out. And at that stage, my wife thought, something's going wrong here. So by the time the ambulance came, I was really out of it. I have no recollection of what happened, but apparently I was taken into A&E where I was diagnosed with a septicemia, um, which very quickly um, progressed to a thing called toxic shock, where my organs started shutting down. Um, and they put me into a um, drug-induced coma. So, now, as far as the family were concerned, I was totally unresponsive to the outside world. Uh, no response to anything. From my point of view, I have very clear recollections of many things that happened. Um, and at no time was I frightened or scared. I felt very cozy and warm. I didn't really know where I was. I knew something had happened, but I didn't know what. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time philosophizing, philosophizing about religion, about how the mind works, uh, about genes. It was quite strange. I could hear quite a lot of what was going on, uh, but I couldn't respond to it. And I heard somebody say, we think he's had a stroke. I thought, I don't want to live. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I don't want to live and I switched off. And apparently around this time, I really deteriorated. The family were called in to say goodbye, um, and really it was all over. Fortunately, I then heard somebody say, no, he hasn't had a stroke. And again, I can remember my mind working and thinking, but I'm going to fight it. And I was determined to fight it. And apparently things turned around. Of course it was amazing medicine and amazing medical care, but I'm absolutely convinced that the state of mind really affected the outcome, which could have gone either way. They started to um, lift me out of the coma, and of course the family had no idea what I was going to be like. Would I just be a gibbering mess? Um, would I be able to speak? Would I hear? Would I see? Um, but I did come out of it, and apparently my first words were very powerful expletives, which are um, not very common for me, so that brought a big laugh to everybody, and that was a tension release, I understand. I was then discharged from intensive care. It was at that time that I found that my kidneys had failed. So I had stage three acute kidney injury the worst, it's completely gone. I can tell you that going on dialysis is a major, major event. It has a profound effect on your life and on your family's life. So I um, started the dialysis, which entailed going into a special unit where they have these dialysis machines which are a little bit like Daleks sitting by the side of your bed. And so the blood from my body is taken out through the tube, put through the dialysis machine, effectively cleaned in the dialysis machine and put back into my body because the kidneys are responsible for removing many, many waste products from your body. And if, if they're allowed to build up in there, well, ultimately, you'd die. There was no way my kidneys were going to recover. So the dialysis was keeping me alive. Just to give you an example of how I felt, and this continued for the whole of the 14-month period that I was on dialysis, 
uh, felt extremely cold, had horrible, horrible nausea, which just would not go away. And during the intensive care period, partly as a result, I understand, of the toxic shock, I had started to develop gangrene um, in my feet, it started to spread up my legs and uh, in my hands. Fortunately, most of it settled down, but I had to have my toes amputated. Um, I did keep one big toe, so that was a bit of consolation on that one. You put that package together, it's a pretty severe impact on the life of somebody who was running and playing tennis and at the top of their career. During this period, I was put on the um, waiting list for a transplant. Um, I wasn't terribly convinced one would come along because of my blood group. Suddenly, out of the blue, my wife's cousin's daughter came along and offered, and she, surprisingly, was a better match than my son's. I decided to, um, to go for it. Um, and so the date was set up for um, the kidney transplant, which was March 2010. It was quite exciting, really. You know, you think, well, this is possibly going to change my life. And um, of course, the thoughts before that were, how do you say thank you to somebody who potentially is going to give you back your life? There's actually nothing you can really say that's meaningful. Uh, and I played it through my mind time and again. And, and in the end, that's exactly what I said to her. I said, you know, I'd love to find the words to thank you for what you're doing, but there's nothing that I can say other than that you'll be giving me and the family back my life. And she said, well, if I see that, that's all I need. So I'm thinking that as I go down to theatres, um, going to sleep was not a problem, waking up wasn't a problem. My first thoughts were, wow, I'm alive. And then really interestingly, my second thought was, this is amazing. For the first time in 14 months, I don't feel any nausea. In many respects, my core values are still the same. Family are incredibly important to me. When I was really, really ill, pretty well on the way out from this world, uh, as I said, I like to set challenges. And one of the challenges that I set myself was, I'm going to ski with all my grandchildren. And last weekend, I skied with all five of my grandchildren at the same time. At the end of the day, I said to the family, well, this has been pretty emotional for me. I've done it. I've skied with all of you. And they all said, great. Does that mean you haven't got anything else to live for now? We're getting worried. <laughs> but that's not true. <laughs> and I started playing tennis. Uh, it was really interesting without any toes, so a bit worried to start with. Uh, but I've only fallen over two or three times, and uh, I still play, play a pretty good game of tennis. The point is that that transplant unit of the Royal Free is just tremendous. The care that they offer you, the confidence that they give to you, the experience that they've had, it was all under control. You know, they've seen it all before and they pass on that confidence to you. Where does this leave me with this project um, with DeepMind? I think that perhaps you can see that from what I've said, if a patient gets AKI3 that goes unchecked or gets an earlier type of AKI which is untreated and progresses, the impact for the patient and their family is major, major, major. And on top of that, the impact for the health service is major, major, major because the treatment and the cost that goes into the management of that patient are large. If there's an automated system which is gathering data that is already there and then ringing alarm bells when it's putting together the picture that AKI is happening, then that must be good. I just see this app as being the starting point 
of something that could explode. And I, I don't think it's just AKI, it's going to expand into cardiology, diabetic care, you know, it's just endless. I mean, just think about it, in a busy NHS um, consultant, let's just take the consultant, maybe seeing I don't know, 30, 40, 50 patients a day, each of them with complex problems, with data coming in from everywhere. Um, it's impossible for them to act on all of that and make the right decisions. Anything like this that can help has to be good.